uh, as a cognitive scientist, I spend a lot of my time thinking about thinking, about how our minds work and how we come to know what we know. The question about this that I want to discuss today is one that's been debated for centuries, but I'm pretty sure we can sort it all out in the next 18 minutes. The question is, what role does experience play in shaping our brains and minds? Well, the answer may seem obvious, right? We learn through the experience of interacting with our physical and our social world, uh, through conversation, uh, through play, through sports, through customs and rituals, through TED Talks. Surely, what comes in through our, our eyes, our ears, our hands, makes up most of what we have in our minds, right? Well, perhaps surprisingly, this has not been the dominant view in the cognitive sciences. Uh, on the contrary, uh, a, a prevailing view has been that regardless of our experiences, we all share a single universal mind. This idea is linked to a theory uh, by Noam Chomsky, the father of modern linguistics. Uh, prior to Chomsky, people had been exploring how languages differ in the, the, the sounds they use, the words they have or don't have, the grammatical structures. Chomsky argued that beneath all of this variation, all of this superficial variation across languages, there is a, a, a common underlying structure, a set of principles that gives rise to the structure of all human languages, a universal grammar. Chomsky and his followers generalized this theory beyond language, uh, some suggesting that most of what's interesting about the mind is encoded in the human genome and is therefore universal. The theory of a universal grammar and more broadly of a universal mind has been incredibly influential. An academic's influence uh, can be measured by the number of times other writers cite their published work. In order to get in the same ballpark with Chomsky, you have to compare his influence, compare his citations, to those of someone like Shakespeare uh, or the Bible. Why? Well, no question, this theory is really important for scientific reasons. Uh, it's elegant, it's comprehensive, it offers potential solutions to some really hard problems. But I want to suggest that there are also non-scientific, social reasons for the success of universalist theories of the mind. The founders of my field of cognitive science were children during World War II. The Holocaust was in their living memory. When they were writing their seminal works, the civil rights movement was being born. America was being called upon to renew its commitment uh, to our belief that all of us are created equal. It was a really good time for a theory of the human mind, according to which visible, palpable differences can be brushed aside because we're all the same underneath. Our minds are what make us who we are. So if people are all the same, then there must be a universal mind. Well, let's consider an alternative, a potential reconciliation between universals and experience. Let's suppose there is a universal starting point to the mind. Babies come equipped with some innate knowledge, some inborn knowledge, and a set of principles that guide learning for all of us in the same way. Well, even if this is true, this universal starting point isn't where the mind's development ends, it's where it begins. The same learning mechanisms operating in different physical or social contexts could give rise to different ways of thinking. Well, how can we find out if this is what happens? Well, we just need to study people with different sets of experiences and find out whether they think differently as a consequence. So this has been attempted, notably, uh, in the arena of language, famously or infamously, depending upon who you ask, by an amateur linguist in the 1930s named Benjamin Worf. Worf asked, does our experience using language influence the way we perceive and understand the world? Innocent-seeming question, right? Well, uh, Worf noted, for example, that the Hopi language differs from English in the way it describes time. He suggested that this linguistic difference must lead the Hopi to conceptualize time differently than we do. This idea uh, that language influences the way people think uh, has come to be known as linguistic relativity. Perhaps some aspects of the way we think vary relative to the way we talk. Well. Worf made a lot of really interesting observations, but linguistics was just a hobby for him. 
He published his writings, if he published them at all, in places where they were unlikely to make an impact. And yet, they made a huge impact. They ignited an academic firestorm that's still burning today. Why? Well, uh, no question, there are some scientific reasons why people disagreed with Worf. But the qualms people have with Worf science don't explain the almost religious fervor with which his ideas have been resisted, and why being called a Worfian is still an epithet in some circles today. Again, I want to suggest there is a non-scientific social reason why people don't like linguistic relativity. And it's the flip side of the non-scientific social reason why people do like the universal mind. Worf's claim was that people are not all the same. Human minds differ across groups. Well, this suggestion makes people feel uncomfortable, especially if one group is less technologically advanced, more primitive than another. Worf tried to combat this feeling of discomfort by assuring his readers uh, that because of their language, the Hopi were actually capable of more sophisticated thinking than, than English speakers. Well, this plan backfired, right? If language can make one group more sophisticated, that means it can make another group less sophisticated. This seems distasteful to us because it threatens our sense of equality, whether or not it's true. So, by the end of the 20th century, when I started to study cognitive science, Worf had been demonized, and linguistic relativity had been marginalized. I was studying at MIT, Chomsky's home, and the stronghold of the universal mind. I was an acolyte to some of the leaders of the anti-Worfian crusade. I never expected to start studying linguistic relativity, and it happened kind of by accident. So, like Worf, I was interested in language and time. Linguists tell us that when people talk about time, they can hardly avoid using spatial words, spatial metaphors. For example, we say things like, I want to take a long vacation. Well, vacations can't be literally long, like a long street or a long ponytail. Uh, but we talk about them as, as if they could. I wanted to find out whether people think about time using space the way metaphors suggest. So we gave people simple time estimation tasks. You'd see, for example, a line growing across a computer screen. And when it disappeared, you had to reproduce how much time it had stayed there. And people did this over and over for lots of different lines. And their job was to ignore how far the line traveled in space and just reproduce its temporal duration. Well, it turns out they couldn't do that. They couldn't ignore space. If a line traveled farther in space, they thought it lasted uh, a longer time. If it was shorter in space, they thought it lasted a shorter time. Uh, and this was of interest because this was some of the first evidence that people don't just talk about time in terms of space. They really think about time in terms of space. Uh, and I assumed that this was a human universal. Durations are long or short in language and in thought because of the very nature of time itself, because time is linear, right? Well, a Greek speaker made me question this assumption. I was in Greece one summer presenting this research and boldly asserting that across languages, people import the structure and the content of a phrase like a long rope into the domain of time and use expressions like a long meeting. Uh, and my data show that people think about it accordingly. And this Greek speaker raises her hand and says, look, that's not how we talk about time in Greek, and that's not how I think about it. In Greece, there are no long meetings. There are only big meetings. Uh -huh. Well, she went on to explain that Greek talks about time using a different spatial metaphor. Rather than saying a long night, Greek speakers would say a big night, big in three-dimensional space like a big building. Rather than saying a long party, Greek speakers would say a party that lasts much. The word much is also used for spatial quantities like much water. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, all of the Greek speakers are nodding. Yes, of course, that's how we talk about time, doesn't everybody? Uh, uh, right? A Hindi speaker in the audience raises his hand and says, uh, I believe my language is like Greek. We also use three-dimensional space to talk about time. If you tell me that a meeting is halfway over, I imagine a liter bottle of Coca-Cola that is halfway full. Really? I don't think that's what I do. So I'm really grateful to whoever this Hindi speaker was because his comment suggested an experiment that changed the course of my research and eventually of my thinking about the human mind. 
Uh, we made a three-dimensional analog of the growing line task. People saw a container gradually filling up with water uh, and reproduced how much time it stayed on the screen, ignoring how full it had become. If Greek and English speakers think about time the way they talk about it, using different kinds of space, then this should be revealed in their non-linguistic time estimation. The alternative, of course, is that whatever effect lines and containers may have on people's time estimates, this should be the same across groups. Why? Because differences across languages are superficial. Underneath, people's basic temporal thinking should be the same universally. This is the outcome that I predicted, and I was completely wrong. The data turned out just the way language predicted. So we kept doing experiments until it became undeniable that people's experience using language was shaping their basic thinking about time. Thinking about time may be a human universal, but the way we think about time depends on the languages that we speak. So these data vindicate WARF, right? But happily, they also help to address some of the social discomfort that people feel uh, in thinking about relativity research. Overall, Across groups, people's time, time estimates were about equally accurate. It wasn't the case that the English speakers were better than the Greek speakers or vice versa. They were just using different kinds of information to estimate time. So uh, saying that language causes people to think differently doesn't necessarily mean that it causes one group to think better than another or worse than another. That said, what if it does? If language can cause differences, that don't correspond to any value judgment. Shouldn't it also be able to cause differences that do? There are myriad aspects of language, many, many aspects of cognition, and lots of ways that it, they can interact with one another. Shouldn't it be the case, shouldn't we expect, that language A might enable its speakers to think better by some standard uh, than speakers of language B? Well, if you find this idea shocking, hold on to your hats, because this is no longer just a hypothetical. There is growing evidence uh, uh, that this is simply a fact of how our minds work, how experience with language can shape our minds. Suppose I show you a plate with four apples on it. Then I take it away, and I show you another plate with five apples on it. Could you tell me which plate had more apples on it? Of course you could. Couldn't anybody, at least any grown-up? Well, the answer seems to be no. The answer seems to be that you can only answer this question, uh, that you can only distinguish four of something from five of something reliably if you are exposed to a counting system, like our number words, one, two, three, four, five, etc. This has been shown most compellingly by Susan Golden Meadow, my colleague here at the University of Chicago. Susan's team studied number concepts in members of a deaf community in Nicaragua. Some of these people had hearing parents, so they didn't learn sign language until later in life, and they never learned to count. Well, they also appear to have no concepts of exact number greater than three or four. If you hold up seven fingers and ask them to do the same, they'll hold up approximately seven, sometimes seven, maybe six, maybe nine. If you drop eight nuts into a can and ask them to match that number of nuts, they can't do it. They can put in approximately eight, but that's the best that they can do. These are intelligent, fully functional adults who have families, who hold jobs, and who are members of a society of counters, where there's clearly incentive to deal with exact numbers. And yet, without number words, these people live in a world of, of, of uh, without number words, these people live in a world of approximate quantities apparently unable to think a thought like exactly 17 or even exactly 5. Why does this matter? Well, here's an example of how language can cause differences between minds with far-reaching implications. Exact number concepts don't just enable us to count apples. They're the basis for our ability to do math. And math is the basis for our technological world. The cars we drive, the phones in our pockets, the electric lights over our head, much of life as we know it depends on people's ability to use exact number, which in turn depends on our experience with word. Experience with this particular aspect of language radically changes our minds. And in this case, many people would say it changes them for the better, 
better that is by our culture's standards, uh, because we value the things that numbers enable us to do, what they, what they enable us to accomplish. This includes things like treating cancer, but it also includes things like inventing Xbox, uh, things that are not part of other cultures and are clearly not valued universally. Still, compared to these late sign language learners and to members of other groups who lack number words and number concepts, our numerical thinking is more precise and more powerful, and it opens up a world of possibilities. But this is not because members of these other groups lack the intelligence to use numbers, nor is it because of any intrinsic cognitive limitation. It's because they haven't had the critical kind of linguistic experience. So where does this leave us? Well, people may start off with an innate cognitive endowment that we all share. And there may be universal principles by which we all learn. But there is no universal mind. Experience changes our minds such that people with different experiences come to think differently in some ways that are subtle and in some ways that are staggering. Furthermore, language is only one of the streams of experience that shapes our brains and minds. They're also shaped by the cultures we're immersed in and even by the bodies that we use to interface with our world. And yet, the extent of our cognitive diversity has remained in the realm of the unknown, in part because we've been afraid to explore this territory. Why? Well, some people who oppose linguistic relativity research have made it clear that they do so out of moral obligation. Obligation to avoid seeing one group as different from another because it might mean that, that group, one group is better than another in some way. I want to suggest it is our moral obligation not to ignore differences. By ignoring differences between individuals and groups, by assuming a universal mind, we forfeit the opportunity to understand more fully how human knowledge is constructed. For instance, a fuller understanding of the role that language plays in developing number concepts could be the key to helping people learn them better. It could be the key, perhaps, to closing the math achievement gap that separates different populations in our schools. Our squeamishness about saying that anyone is different from anyone else has a noble origin. It's part of our commitment to equality, which has been a guiding principle for our, cultu for our culture since the Age of Enlightenment. But even if we are all created equal, experience changes us. Not necessarily for the better or the worse, just for the different. There's a much older conception of enlightenment, the Buddhist conception, which tells us that a first step on the path to enlightenment is seeing things as they really are, not as we assume they are or as we think they should be. There is no question that in the past, research on linguistic and cultural differences has been abused. It's been used to justify bigotry. It's been used to motivate oppression. Obviously, this is wrong. But the right solution is not to close our eyes and pretend that there are no differences. We can't fight ignorance with ignorance. It is precisely because differences can lead to discrimination that we need to understand them. Blinding ourselves to our differences doesn't make them go away. It's only by recognizing them, by studying their origins and their implications, that we can prevent differences from becoming sources of injustice. Some people have denounced the idea of linguistic or cultural relativity because they think it denies a fundamental human nature. I want to suggest exactly the opposite. By exploring cognitive diversity, we can develop a broader, more inclusive understanding of human nature, one that someday might extend to all humans and not just to the ones who think like us. Thank you.